Hey everyone, welcome back to Dev Interrupted. I'm your host, Connor Bronston. We're here at the DevOps Enterprise Summit in the Dev Interrupted Dome, and I'm excited to be joined by Dr. Stephen J. Spear, a senior lecturer at MIT, founder of Cita Solve, and co-author of the upcoming release with Gene Kim, Wiring the Winning Organization. Uh, welcome to the show, Steve. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah, really glad to be here. Uh, I'm glad you could bear with me while I flubbed the intro like three times here. You didn't laugh too hard, which I appreciated. And uh, I'm, I'm really excited to have another author on the show because it's, it's honestly been a while. And this isn't actually your first time writing a book either. You also previously authored the book, The High Velocity Edge. Right. What did that teach you about writing books that you've applied now to wiring the winning organization? Oh, yeah, thanks. So uh, first of all, I guess one key lesson is work with Gene Kim. It's a very good experience. <laughs> Last time I you know, solo authored, and anyway, that's a whole separate story. But uh, let me tie it back to content. So uh, both books, both uh, Wiring the Winning Organization and The High Velocity Edge, which preceded it, come out of the same motivation, is that um, I came a professional age in the late 80s, early 90s, when uh, Japanese companies were posing this existential threat to American competitors. And I was one of many, many people who were trying to understand what they were doing different that on any given day, those organizations were able to generate and deliver so much more value into society than their American counterparts. And what um, I came to appreciate after years of study and immersion in places like Toyota was that the winners had created far better conditions for people to give fuller expression to their ingenuity, their creativity, their minds, internal capacity to solve problems in front of them and then have those individual efforts harmonize and integrate in a beautifully choreographed fashion into collective action towards common purpose. Mm. Um, in terms of you know, your question, what did I learn um, from the high velocity edge to the uh, wiring the winning organization? The first book was uh, based on my work with industrially intensive organizations. Toyota is at least half the book. Alcoa is a major case study in there. And so in that book, I um, gave a lot of expression to the design of linear processes and how they can be designed to make it easier for the individual to understand where he or she fit into the larger whole, accomplish their work, accomplish their work in such a way that uh, when it's passed on as a intermediate input into the next step, those handoffs and exchanges are very good. And also around this idea that anything we design is going to glitch at some point. This idea that not only do you have to design things with your best understanding, but you have to design them so they reveal very quickly and early and often that something's going wrong. So in that book, I call this idea, design things so that you can see problems, so it quickly triggers this uh, response to solve a problem. And you mentioned, and I appreciate the mention of the uh, software we've designed, and it's built, and actually our company is called C2Solve, so it's around that. So making the transition into wiring is that working with Gene, um, we shifted, I wouldn't say shifted, we expanded our area of concern from processes which look industrial in that they um, lay out in a linear fashion, sequential fashion through time, and expanded to worry about things that are spread out over space, you know, technical systems. Um, what we discovered, and I think it was, you know, fabulously exciting and validating, is that the same issues um, uh, exist, that how you create the conditions as a leader, the conditions you create for those people for whom you're responsible, fabulously affects their ability to bring their ingenuity to bear on the problems which you as a collective are trying to solve. Um, where we went with this is that um, we had a better appreciation that we're designing around the minds of human beings and that we have to worry not only about things which uh, exist uh, spread out over time, but which are spread out over space. I think that's a, a wonderful insight because so many people hear phrases like organizational system design or system design, and they, they simply think, oh, well, I'm designing a technology system. They don't think about the people that are leveraging that system or right. the, the, the people that make up these organizations. And high-performing teams need the right conditions to, to deliver. So what did you identify that was so similar for these high-performing teams across both manufacturing and these uh, other styles of teams that you mentioned? That's right. Yeah, great question. So... um. In the book, we introduced this notion of three layers at which people express their ingenuity, their creativity, and that sort of thing. And um, again, this this was a, a very important insight in writing this book, which I hadn't realized in the in the first one. And is this the three mechanisms of performance? So it's on the way to those three mechanisms, 100%. So um, the first layer is uh, the object in front of the person. So, um, it, you know, literally, that could be 
you know, a ball valve or, um, you know, a submarine hatch sitting on a bench top in front of a mechanic who's tasked with fixing that thing. Um, you know, sort of more modern technology. It might be the, uh, the genetic code, which is sitting someplace that someone is trying to manipulate to, uh, deal with an ailment, fix a disease, that kind of thing, or, or the code itself yeah. that uh, your community worries about. So that's layer one. Um, and the capabilities and concerns on layer one are very technical engineering concerns. Layer two is the instrumentation through which people work on the object in front of them. So, you know, that, uh, that mechanic who's working on a ball valve or a motor or whatnot, it might be the, uh, the, um, the tooling, the machining um, that they use to uh, deal with voids and pits and that kind of thing. For the person working on DNA, it might be the CRISPR technology that allows mm. them to manipulate that. And then there are the tools that you use in the software world to affect the code. So that's layer two. Also, very technical, very engineering, uh, very scientific. This is when we get to layer three, is that layer one and layer two, we can imagine the individual using that instrumentation on the object in front of him or her. When we get to layer three, what are we worried about? is we're worried about the processes, the procedures, the routines, the norms by which all those individual efforts at all those uh, literal and metaphorical bench tops, how all those individual efforts uh, integrate into this uh, collective action towards common purpose. Um, in the book, we refer to that overlay of um, processes and procedures as uh, circuitry, social circuitry. Mm. And we use that term circuitry, uh, not metaphorically, but really deliberately. You start thinking about um, what a circuit does, a technical circuit. It takes something which is in high concentration in one location, but where it's not needed, let's say charge, and it allows it to flow um, efficiently, effectively to where it's in low concentration, but actually needed. And when, you know, and sometimes the, the circuitry is, exists not to just allow for the flow, but allow things to mix and commingle and react. Whatever the case is, you start thinking about why we have processes and procedures and organizations is that you're working on something, Adam's working on something, Brett's working on something, I'm working on something, and, and we're all doing good work, but that individual work is uh, necessary, but it's not sufficient to achieve that common purpose. And it's by the way in which um, the work we're doing becomes coordinated, collaborative, integrated, harmonized, choreographed, that determines whether we're successful or not. So uh, when we wrote Wiring, we were very, very concerned about um, guidance on how to design that social circuitry, that layer three overlay of processes and procedures so that people can um, invest their ingenuity on the hard problems in front of them for which society will value the solutions and not in a poor, poorly designed or poorly wired organization spend so much time, so much ingenuity, so much emotional energy just trying to figure out where they fit into the larger whole that they have little energy left over for the, uh, the hard problems in front of them. I'm really interested in this concept because we talk a lot about this amorphous idea of you know team culture, team dynamics, and the social circuitry. Cir the social circuitry of a team seems like a great way to describe it. Honestly, I, I plan to borrow this phrase and use it repeatedly. I'll try to reference you back. But don't worry. <laughs> Please do. Um, can you dig more into what you saw the most high-performing teams do as far as constructing that social circuitry? Yeah. So, um, for uh, technologists, engineers, scientists. There's a tremendous deliberate concern with the architecture of the objects on which they're working, the design of um, the circuits on a chip, the design of the codes in a larger software package, um, the shape of uh, the teeth on a gear so it meshes properly with the, uh, the apparatus into which it's inserted. So there's a lot of concern about that architecture. And uh, certainly there's a lot of concern with the architecture of the design, the operation of the instrumentation with th through which people work. What's um, and un, what's a missed opportunity um, too often is a similar engineer's concern for the, for the design, the operation, and the improvement of this social circuitry that determines how people will work together. And what ends up happening, in the absence of having a simple first principle-based way to think about the design of the social circuitry, because we have those, right? We have principles we use to talk about the design of the object and the instrumentation. Right. But in the absence of being able to uh, talk in a first principles, I'm sorry, a first principles way about the design of the social circuitry overlay, we get stuck with some things like, well, trust is important. It's mm. like, yeah, duh, trust is important. You know, I mean, if, if I think you're going to stab me in the back, I'm never going to turn my back on you. Um, respect is important. Again, yeah, duh. You know, if you walk into a situation and you think I'm going to be insulting and ridiculing, we're not going to, I mean, th those are all given, but, you know, th those, those fall into the category of things I learned in kindergarten. Um, 
so yes, they're important, but important in sort of an obvious way. What's uh, important in a less obvious way is this uh, methodical, deliberate approach towards designing um, process and procedure with due co full consideration, in fact, almost as an objective function, um, consideration for how people's minds work and the type of problems they can solve well, the type of problems they can um, they struggle with, and making sure that the circuitry is designed with that consi those considerations in mind. What's an organization that you think does this really well? All right, so look, I'm going to have to um, root back to uh, Toyota, right? And you know, I know you know people may be listening. I've gotten this for now 30 years. Oh, we don't make cars, so bear with me a little bit. But um, when we we start off the book and say, you know, who should read this book and why? We talk about how important it is for leaders to read this book um, if they want to understand how to put their organizations to the front of the pack. And so here's what I mean, and this is why I think Autos is actually a very good example. Um, and again, for the people who say, oh, we don't make cars, just understand uh, a car is about as complex a technical system as, as exists. You know, the millions of lines of code that sit on a Prius is actually, you know, way beyond, I think, what happened is, uh, most of, anyway, I'm going to stop making the case for cars. If you don't like cars, you, you, you've dismissed me already. But anyway, why, why do we look at that? Is uh, one of the points or the opening points Gene and I make in the book is that um, when you have level playing field competition, you know, your organization and mine are looking more or less at the same market space. We're looking for the same and probably finding similar market opportunities. We're depending on the same resources for uh, capital equipment, raw materials, uh, um, um, workforce. Uh, we're operating under the same set of rules and regulations, right? It is very level playing field. And yet what we see is some organizations which, given all that commonality of input, all that commonality of challenge, the differences in output are extraordinary. I mean, right. they're just like crazy. And, um, you know, this was certainly exemplified back in the auto industry in the 1980s when people were worried about Japan and an existential threat. But the, and the numbers then, just to, you know, anchor this for people, what, people were, what was being observed is that in the production of automobiles, which is a very difficult thing because the factory that you have to design and operate involves thousands of people yeah. doing this choreographed work to get cars coming off the line every 50 seconds. And increasingly automated, all this oh. new technology, bringing in IoT, all this stuff. Absolutely. You know, I mean, th this is a non-trivial problem to get an auto factory to make one car, let alone one every 50 seconds. Right. Look at how many car startups fail. That's right. Bingo. Um, so, uh, you know, apropos of this um, level playing field competition, but non-level playing field outcome, so when people first started looking at the, um, the auto industry, they said, holy cow, on any given day, everyone performs about the same level of productivity, effectiveness, efficiency, except this handful of factories which uh, produce twice the cars with half the people and half the time, half the resources and half the space. So I don't know if that's 2X, 4X, 8X, or 16X, but whatever it is, it's a lot. And then when they started looking at design, um, they said, oh, wait a second, everyone takes more or less the same number of uh, calendar years and number of engineering years to design a new model. Yet there's these uh, exceptions to the rule with half the people and half the calendar time, they generate twice the designs and the designs are better both for manufacturing and market appeal. And he here's the thing, you know, stepping out of autos, you start seeing the same ratios of um, exceptionalism across these multiple dimensions simultaneously, quality, productivity, safety, and you know, workplace safety, security for data, um, time to market, product variety, product responses, re resilience, agility, reliability, and so on, all concentrated, all great concentrated on one or two organizations in a sector and everyone else. And this, is, this is in healthcare, it's in education, it's in IT, obviously. So anyway, um, what, what seems to be, you know, that's a huge uh, elaboration why look at cars and the examples. So why look at Toyota is because um, they're in about as competitive a field as exists in the world. And um, not only do they have leadership on nearly every important dimension, but they've maintained that leadership for 50 years. Right. 50 years. It's like, all right, I mean, I know the Boston Celtics, they won a lot of championships for a period. The Lakers won a lot. The Yankees won a lot. The Patriots, obviously, I'm from New England. I got to, you know, throw that in. Oh, you're a Patriots fan? Uh, I'm sorry. I know that lands badly with the West Coast folks. Oh, um, I'm a Seahawks fan. So it was just a tough year a couple years back. That, yeah, was, yeah. that was a tough Super Bowl. So for what, as an aside, <laughs> we, we, I wrote up a whole case study around 2015 about the Malcolm Butler interception. Oh, so, okay. I, and we'll probably I'll go read that. that later. Yeah, so I hope you're not poisoning my water now. <laughs> um, but uh, 
a 50-year dominance in a field with that level of competitiveness. Incredibly hard. You, you got to say, what the heck is going on there that's not going on elsewhere? And, yeah. and again, tying back to my first research going back to the 90s, is what we found is that Toyota had created an organization which was um, a knowledge factory. They had designed their systems in such a way that uh, the systems themselves, the systems of moving material and producing parts and turning inputs into outputs, were deliberately designed around designed towards the cognitive strength of people and away from the cognitive weaknesses. And so with all the problems involved in building a factory, launching a model, running a factory on a day-to-day -day basis, the, the environment was such that people's minds could be more fully engaged individually and collectively yeah. on solving those problems, whereas you went into their competitors. It was just so overwhelming, confusing, and frustrating that the human intellect um, had very little ability to give itself full expression. So it sounds like you're saying something which I think we've seen in a lot of research recently, which is that high performance is predicated on cutting down on friction points, cutting down on distractions, and being able to achieve flow state and really focus. That's right. Yeah, and I appreciate the, uh, the notion of flow because um, in the book we talk about three mechanisms, which if each is, indiv in e if each is em employed, I'm sorry, if each is employed individually, you make it much easier for people. And obviously if you use the combination, so um, the three mechanisms we call one is slowification, and that plays on to the research of Daniel Kahneman, Amos Tversky, thinking fast and slow, yeah. and creating situations in which people can engage their slow, creative, deliberative, generative thinking, rather than having to be in a fast thinking, impulsive, reactive kind of modality. So that's one. And then we have this uh, third mechanism we call amplification, which is uh, to make it more obvious that problems exist to be solved in the first place. But within um, sandwich between slowification which is to make it easier to solve problems and amplification to make it more obvious that problems exist, we have this thing called simplification. And simplification is to actually change the nature of the problems so that the problems themselves are easier to solve, that the piece in front of the individual is more um, um, tractable, uh, understandable, so on and so forth. And that way, as the pieces come together, they come together more simply. Anyway, the reason I went into that is you mentioned creating flow. It turns out within this simplification mechanism, creating flow um, across functions, across departments, across specialties, so, so that things have a more sequentiality to them, as opposed to having work jump back and forth, uh, move over here, move over there, get past to this department, this division, yeah. this function, this subject matter expert, boom, 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 boom. Just line the, uh, the work, the people who are expert at doing that work, lining them up so there can be this baton pass of uh, value as it accumulates. It turns out flow is a critical technique within this idea of wiring organizations around the cognitive strengths and away from the cognitive um, weaknesses of people. It makes total sense. I mean, reducing context switching, letting people focus on these things is really crucial. And I know that you know, we've seen it in software development, continuous, uh, continuous growth, continuous implementation, continuous delivery, these things where we say, okay, let's take a process, let's uh, apply workflows to it, let's iterate on it continuously and, yep. and create this like knowledge cap capture mechanism, which I know Beautiful. you talk about, I want to yep. dig into, um, where you can then say, okay, like let's create an iterative process that's going to work continuously for folks and hopefully continue to improve. So I know you mentioned this in the book as well, this knowledge capture piece that's saying like we're learning from our mistakes and we're continuing to grow, right. like reducing the friction points. Can you dig into that a bit? Yeah, absolutely. So um, look, the baby, you know, when we wrote the book, we said, look, the why to read the book is you're leading an organization which has accepted onto itself a mission and you want to succeed um, better, faster, with more certainty than not. All right, so that's why I read it. Um, we have this kind of rhetorical question, which is, well, why do we even create organizations in the first place? And, you know, and again, it's to accomplish mission, but, but why an organization? Why don't we do that individually? And the reason is there's more work to do than any individual can ever right. hope to accomplish, right? And, you know, when we start talking about projects, you know, the, um, the hundreds of thousands of engineering years involved in designing something, right? So, you know, it's not like you say, well, I'll do it myself. It'll just take more time. No, I don't have thousands of years. I have a few. Um, so, uh, you know, as we start talking about this, uh, why we create organizations, we create organizations because there's more work than an individual or small group can do. But there's a key point here. It's uh, not just sort of the heavy lifting. Like you grab one end of the couch, I'll grab the other end of the couch. 
it's the problem solving. In the book, we have a couple of vignettes um, to kind of illustrate in very simple terms the, um, the largest class of problems. And the first vignette is about two guys, Gene and Steve, trying to move a couch. And the point we're trying to make is that even something as uh, sort of uh, familiar as moving a couch is uh, not entirely a brawn problem, it's a brain problem. Right. That um, the, part of the reason you have Gene and Steve moving the couch together is yes, Steve has to lift one end and Gene has to lift the other. But part of the reason you need two people involved is there's questions about balance, there's questions about navigation, there's questions about grip points, there's questions about, um, um, you know, how do we go up the stairs and down the stairs and in the out the door and through the narrow hallway, right? There's a lot of problems. And I think anyone who's ever had to move from their first apartment to the second apartment to a dorm room to a, a house is like, oh, yeah, you know, between, you know, it wasn't just, you know, the muscles I brought to this, but it was the problem solving in my ability. And, and there's another part. I've had to host a, uh, hoist a couch out a window and uh, down off a balcony. That's, <laughs> That's sometimes right. Sometimes you got to do it. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, I once had a refrigerator down a slope oh, roof. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, all right, we're talking. This, and, and you realize that your ability, whether it's the couch off the balcony or the refrigerator um, down the slope roof, and part of it depended, did you have this sort of the horsepower to, you know, control the couch? But part of it is, um, were you able to work in a collaborative, problem-solving, creative fashion with the person on the other end of the couch or the refrigerator right. so no one got hurt? No one got crushed. Yeah. That's right. Absolutely. You know, and you're here, I'm here, so I guess it worked that well. Hey, worked we don't out. know about the other two guys. Maybe they're on the <laughs> yeah, other side. Right? Let's not talk about that, okay? <laughs> yeah. Right? But, um, you know, what we're setting up is that really we form organizations because uh, it's not just the brawn work, which is more than one person can do. It's the brain work. Yeah. And if it's the brain work, which is more than one person, then we really have to be quite deliberate and thoughtful and respectful when we design our organizations and their processes and procedures. We design it around the brains of people and not just around the brawn. And this is really interesting because it, it does correlate to a lot of other research we've seen. So we talked about thinking fast and slow is a great example. Uh, another great example is the research that's been done around teams that are high performing and the importance of diversity of ideas. That's bringing right. Bringing in these different voices and then maximizing that for creativity, getting these massive productivity gains. You know, you point out design as one area like that's a huge opportunity. 100 percent on that. So, um, you know, again, you know, we, you know, it's kind of, you know, there's, I don't know if it's a. A parable, but you know, the notion of the blind man trying to describe an elephant. And, uh, you know, the person with the limited perspective describes the elephant as a, as a phone pole because they grab the, the leg versus a snake because they grab the trunk or whatever. And, you know, the way that story is told, it's kind of like, well, those poor people who can't see well, I, like, like somehow the seven blind people trying to describe the elephant, you know, a normal person could, you know, someone who had normal sight, not, 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 not vision problems. But the reality is we're all blind. And I think that you know, we have, if we start with the acceptance that um, none of us can see and understand the whole and that um, the li our life is nothing but elephants um, and we're all blind about the elephant, then what we have to do is create systems in which um, we're set up for each of us to take our imperfect and incomplete understanding and have that synthesized together to a much better whole. I mean, look at every founder we talk to on this show, every every great leader. They talk about the importance of hiring great people and putting them in a position to succeed. Right. And that's exactly what we're talking about at scale um, and consistently. That's so right. I, I'd love to dig in a bit more and say, like, what are the other insights that people can expect when they read the book? Yes. Yeah, so um, you, you mentioned uh, founders and leaders, and we, we create this um, this notion of the, the iconic leader who's uh, – all seeing and all understanding and that kind of thing. I remember many, many years ago, uh, I had a, there was a kid in our community who was a big fan of Bill Gates. And he said, oh, Bill Gates reads every line of code. It's like, really? You know, uh, the boy's name was Al a AJ. It's like, AJ, let's think about this for a second. How many lines of code are in, and this is way back, right? Yeah. So it was far less than today. How many lines of code are there? You know, it was, you know, you know, X gigantic number. And it's like, all right, how long does it take to read one line of code? Now let's do the, the, the math here. How long would it take them to read every line of code in just one package? It's like forever. Yeah. Right? How many packages do they have? A lot. So it would take a lot forever. So, all right. So the thing is, you know, whether it's Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, and others, we've created this uh, mythology about the, the leader who's, uh, it's their mind and it's the action through everyone else's hands. But it can't be the case. You know, just like with Toyota having a 50-year dominance in its industry, you can't have a company like Microsoft, which has had such a massive presence on a worldwide scale for so long, 
or Apple, which has had such disproportionate impact on how we think and live and interact with each other. It can't be one human brain acting through all these hands. It has to be, it has to be that Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and some of these others where um, the organ, and again, that's the point, the organization has endured way beyond their active involvement, right. right? So even if it was, let's entertain for a moment, it was, oh, well, you know, Bill Gates or Steve Jobs was such a He's genius, right? He's not there anymore, right? though. They, and hasn't been for a long, long time. What they did was they were fantastic architects. And yes, probably initially fantastic architects about the technical object, that's layer one thing but fantastic architects of the layer three systems and processes and culture inside those things that um, so much greatness could be produced with their influence. Now, you know, tying that back to, you know, where does this matter is um, I think, unfortunately, a lot of people come into jobs um, for their technical expertise and they build up their technical expertise and they display and express that technical expertise. And that's fantastic. At some point though, the responsibilities migrate from level one and level two concerns, which is the technical expertise, right. to layer three ones, which is responsibility for other people. And for that, they think, oh, my job now is to um, be the chief decider. I have to gather data, I have and to do the And that doesn't scale long term. Of course it doesn't scale. And the other thing is, if you start thinking about how we express our expertise, our technical expertise on layer one and layer two, it's by solving problems. And no problem gets solved by, oh, I look at the situation and I generate an answer. No, I, I look at a problem and I experiment and I have experience and I iterate and I do all these other things to um, converge on the answer. And I think uh, one of the things we want to accomplish with this book is say to um, leaders of technical organizations who used to be technologists themselves, is the approaches you used before to get to good answers are exactly right. You know, you want to simplify the problems in front of you through modularization, increment, incrementalization. We talk about that in the book. And you want to slow down the problem solving so it's easier to solve problems. You want to make it more obvious you have problems. Everything you've been doing, you want to keep doing. The only thing you want to change is your focus from the technical system to the social technical system. Shift from layer one and layer two to layer three. But if you take the same behaviors, the same disciplines up to layer three, you're likely to succeed. On the other hand, if you think it requires a different set of behaviors and assumptions and approaches, then you may be setting yourself up for less than success. So if I'm a leader, uh, I lead software engineering teams, and I'm trying to apply these lessons to my own team, um, I should apply that same systems thinking that I've applied to my success as a technical leader and my growth into this role to the social circuitry of my team. Yes, that's absolutely right. Are there key pieces of that social circuitry that are of that social circuitry that you should focus on first? Yeah. So um, one of the temptations when people's focus moves from uh, layer one and layer two technical turn technical concerns to layer three social technical concerns is that all of a sudden now they have to worry about um, metrics and reports and meetings about the reports which would capture the metrics and this and that and um, that's not actually how we engineer. The way we engineer is we build something and we run it. And when it glitches, we respect the first glitch, right? And, and, and it might be a local glitch, it might be a little glitch, but the fact that it glitched is a very strong indication that whatever we designed is behaving differently than we had expected or hoped. The encouragement um, when we wrote the book is that leaders will have a similar sympathy, empathy, respect for the individual in their organization. That the person who's struggling um, because uh, the materials they need, the information they need, the documentation, the paperwork, whatever, whatever it is that's missing, where they're glitching. And the, and the evidence of glitching is they sit down to do work and then they have to start foraging for things. They sit down to do the work and um, they have to work around. They have to firefight. They're, they're frustrated that the glitch the individual ex is experiencing is evidence and loud enough evidence that the social circuitry is failing that individual. And if it's failing that individual, without doubt, it's failing other individuals. And you don't have to sit back, wait for the lag, the aggregated data and the report and this thing and have a meeting and a quarterly review to know that the system is not working. You can just uh, go to the shop floor, go to the deck plate, go to the lab, go to the studio, wherever it happens to be. And if I see Connor struggling somehow, I don't have to look further. I know the system is failing Connor, and if the system is failing Connor, it's probably failing Adam and Brent and a bunch of other people too. 
How do you differentiate between a system that's failing team members versus a team member that isn't the right fit? Yeah, so it's funny. I'm going to root back to my Toyota thing is that those are like uh, system thinkers extraordinaire. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, when they walk into a, a plant, let's say, and they see a, 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 an associate go over to do, let's say, install a seat, and it's not easy to grab the four bolts that, bolts that affix the seat to the frame, all right, the system failed the employee. Um, if they reach for a torque wrench, and the torque wrench is not easy and uh, ergonomically um, um, safe to use, et cetera. All right, but here's what they'll also say. If they see an associate trying to put the seat in and the material is all there and everything's nicely presented and they struggle, their first response is, damn, the system that trained that person, it failed them because it put them in a situation for which they're not yet competent. Right. So. In the extreme, in the exemplars, for, for them, everything is a system problem. The fact that you're sitting there struggling, it's like, well, who trained you? You know, what system failed? And this is an interesting way, right? What system, which I, as a leader, was responsible for, what system failed you as an associate that you're putting in a situation for which you're unprepared? Um, what system um, didn't give you the adequate skills? What system uh, gave you the wrong assignment, et cetera? So... Um, yeah, the one thing I'll just offer as uh, sort of generalizing this is this uh, notion of thinking through systems is actually um, it un unencumbers people. Because, you know, the setup for your question is if I see someone failing, um, if I don't think about systems, then I, I'm now in a situation where I have to um, blame the individual. And if I blame the individual, now I have to confront the individual. And what it does is it um, inadvertently generates uh, a, a culture of uh, contest and disagreement and um, maybe victimization, objectification, uh, blamification, however you want to call it. But if we're always thinking about systems, then um, we always come back to we have an engineering, we have an architectural problem to create the system in such a way it supports the individual. Rather than blame the individual, we use the individual as the, uh, the early indicator that the system itself is the is inadequate to the tests assigned onto it. So by that logic, if we eventually decide, actually, we do have to let this individual go, the blame is likely on the hiring system. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, again, it reminds me back of Toyota when um, we were at the, uh, oh, it was the plant in Indiana. And um, I think I talk about it in that first book, The High Velocity Edge. They were um, screening people to work on the assembly line. No, they were screening people to be trained to work on the assembly line. And um, what they had done is they had taken over the gym of uh, a building that had been a high school at one point, and they'd set up a mock assembly line. And it was kind of truth in advertising. You know, people who wanted jobs, who were new recruits, they'd come in and they'd spend some number of hours working in this mock-up of an assembly line. So they understood um, what it looked like and felt like and what the demands were and what the necessary skills were, et cetera, et cetera. And um, there are people who, you know, halfway through, a, you know, one of these uh, simulated uh, virtual shifts said, I don't want to do this. They left. But there were people who not only made it through the shift, but they displayed a certain um, aptitude and acumen for this type of work. But it still turned out that even then going into the training, a surprising number of these people washed out. And what they realized is that it wasn't whether um, a, a recruit and a potential hire made it through one day of the simulation. It's whether after going through the first day, they came back on the second day. Mm, and what they did is they, they, they kaizen, they redesigned this uh, screening process from one 10-hour shift to two eight-hour shifts. Mm. And what they found is that if you know someone came back the se on the second day to do the second eight hours, that person had a much li higher likelihood of then going through the training and being ready for the assembly line work. Um, but if they didn't come back on the second day, that was a good message both for the uh, potential employer and the potential employee that this was a bad fit. Interesting. Well, Steve, this has been fascinating. I've, I've really enjoyed the insights from your book, and I can't, we, I can't wait to read a Wiring the Winning Organization by you and Gene Kim. It's going to be a really interesting read, and I can tell there's a ton of insights in here. Do you have any closing thoughts you want to share with our audience before we wrap up? Yes, thank you. Um, first of all, thanks for the time to My be pleasure. able to have this conversation. You, know, you, you invest um, as much time in the field as I have um, to feed the ideas and then the, you know, the intense uh, collaboration to write this book. 
So um, what we try to accomplish for this book is for people who um, have been or just maybe even just finding themselves right now responsible for other people, there's a way to think about the problems in front of them that the solutions are a matter of creative apl creatively applying some simple principles recursively onto situations to get to good outcomes. And that's actually a good, you know, for those who studied engineering, that's actually very good, right? Because I remember when I was studying um, mechanical engineering, I said, well, what does a mechanical engineer have to do? Look at all the things that are mechanically engineered. And so I said, no, no, Steve, you got to understand solids. Well, will things move or spin or not? You have to understand heat. Well, uh, you know, how quickly will something cool off? And uh, also understand that uh, things that are liquid, they're, they're sticky, gooey, and want to get stuck in places. That's all you need to know. Now, what you have to do is practice the application on the sophisticated Build things. habits of this consistently. That's right. And that's what systems are, really, is they're, they're, they're solving for habits for us. That's right. And so uh, we, what we hope to accomplish with this book is uh, take the mystery and the magic out of um, the design and operation of these complex uh, social technical systems and um, give uh, confidence and comfort to those responsible for other people. There, there's some very simple, basic ways to think about the problems. And the issue is not mastering more and more and more concepts. It's about gaining acumen and skill and speed and applying the same basic principles onto harder and harder and more complex problems. Steve, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, it's been a pleasure and a huge shout out to the IT Revolution Group for having us uh, here for DevOps Enterprise Summit, putting this dome together with us and, and getting Steve on the show. It's uh, been great doing it and uh, really enjoyed the conversation. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, thank you for the, the opportunity to have a discussion. I think about ideas that are uh, really quite important. My pleasure.